this week to a grit. And let me tell you this, before you sit down, there is nowhere else I would rather be. I feel like I need to start by saying this, no matter who you are, where you've been or what you've done, I just believe that you are exactly where you are supposed to be. There is a reason you are in this room or watching online right now. It's because God has something he wants to speak to you. And I can say that with confidence because there's nothing special about me, but the word of God is alive and active. And so let's go straight to the word of God. Our theme verse for grit is this. Real quick, I forgot to say this. Can you guys scoot in if you have seats? You are right where you're supposed to be, but also if you have a seat next to you, maybe, maybe it was one seat to the left. We still got people coming in. If you're still looking for a seat, thank you for your patience. We'll find you one. We love getting to do this together. The word of God is alive and active. Paul says this, Philippians 3, 3, 13 through 14, forgetting what is behind. Let's stop on those first four words for a second. Let the word of God speak to you right now, forgetting what is behind. Anybody need a divine invitation to forget what is behind? Anyone need a divine invitation to forget that thing that happened years ago that still has a lot of shame that you're carrying around? Anyone need a divine invitation to forget that thing that happened this week that has you walking in here like, well, I'll show up to Red Rocks, but God's not gonna speak to me. I'm just happy to not get struck by lightning. Would you stop? Forget what lies behind. Because here's the thing, Paul, the guy that wrote this, he had a past. He, before he was a Christian, he was persecuting Christians. He was throwing Christians in prison. He was beating them. He was having them killed. And yet Paul was able to do all these amazing things for the kingdom of God. Why? Because he didn't walk around going, well, yeah, but I did so many bad things in the past. Maybe I just shouldn't, maybe I should just play small with whatever God's given me. No, these words, these first four words, they were well-earned by Paul. Forget what is behind. When you do that, you're able to strain forward. Listen to the, the verbs that he uses here. Strain, strain toward what is ahead. And then here it is, I press on. Everyone say press on. Toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul goes, hey, following Jesus can be really hard sometimes. There's times where I wanna quit. But you know what, I got too much grit to quit. So we're gonna keep moving forward. That's what this series is all about. In fact, our working definition of grit is this, a God-given ability to step out and press on in difficult situations. That's the kind of person I wanna be. I know it's the kind of person you wanna be. It's the kind of church we wanna have. Not a church that looks at the world and says, oh man, things are getting really tough. It's getting dark, we better go hide. We better go lock our doors. We better go play it safe but a church that says the world's getting dark, sounds like the world's due for some light. Sounds like the world's due for some hope and some peace and for a message of unity. And we can be that church, but we need grit. So today I wanna give you just one really practical way to get some grit. One really practical way. It's gonna sound a little counterintuitive at first. I wanna talk about insecurities. I know, I know. We live in a world that says, cover up the insecurities, don't look at those things, just pretend like they're not there. And I believe that in so doing, we are missing out on tapping into one of the greatest sources of power that God has for us. I think actually when we double down on our insecurities, God is ready to work in and through our lives. So I titled this message, your weakness is your strength. Turn to your neighbor and say, your weakness is your strength. And you can take a seat. Our passage uh, for today, uh, by the way, we have more seats up here. You guys, sorry if you're standing. Thank you all for being here. Hey, our passage for today is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses seven through 10. So if you are new to this church experience, 
Um, quick rundown on what's about to happen is I'm gonna read this passage for us and then we're gonna go back up to the top and take it verse by verse as I just do my best to point out a few things that I've seen in this passage that I believe are going to help you have some grit this week. And then we're gonna sing a little bit more and we'll get you out of here to go enjoy a beautiful afternoon in the best city in the world. Does that sound like a plan? And if you're watching online, I'm sure your city is amazing too. It's just, it's just not quite awesome. But we love you. <laughs> hey, did you know that your weakness is actually your strength? You will. You will by the end of this. Let me just say this before we read. Um, I love getting to do this so much. I love that we get to be imperfect people all pursuing a perfect God together. And this would be not nearly as much fun if I was just talking to Doug and Ethan right now. So thank you for being here. Let's dive into God's word. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 10, it says this. Therefore, this is Paul talking, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was giving, given a thorn in my flesh. We'll talk all about what that may have been. A messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times... I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, this is in my Bible, this is red letters, Jesus talking. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And now this is back to Paul. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, I am strong. It's actually my weakness that when you got, add God to the equation becomes my greatest strength. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Question, have you ever come face to face with your greatest insecurity? <laughs> I would, ask, I would ask you to like shout it out, but so many of you are like, my greatest insecurity is when people ask me to speak in front of lots of people. So I'm not gonna do that. I have had this experience many times in my life. The one that has been on my mind to share today is my junior year of high school, football season. Now, I grew up playing sports, did not grow up playing football. Grew up playing like backyard football, but never officially. And if you know, if you've ever played before, there's a big difference between playing backyard football and playing in a league where you have these massive pads on and a helmet that blocks like half of your view. It just gets a lot harder, right? But my friends convince me, they go, hey, just, just come out for the team, it's gonna be fun. And I go, guys, I'm gonna get destroyed if I play football. Like, let's just, let's just be real. And they go, no, 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 you, you'll just be uh, one of the wide receivers, which is the guy all the way out on the end who just goes deep and will throw you the ball. You won't get hit by all the big guys in the, in the trenches. It's fine. I go, all right. I show up, go through training camp, two days and all of that, and I work my way up to, um, to being the second string receiver, right? So there was one guy ahead of me named Tyler. He was a senior he was already committed to go, to go play college football. I wasn't gonna pass Tyler, but I got to be his second string my junior year. And so the first game rolls around. And my thought is, my only job is to not mess this up. You know, like, like when you're the second string, your job is when the first string is tired, when he, when he gives you the symbol that he needs to come out, I go in for a couple of plays, let him rest while, while I just do my best to not mess everything up. Some of you are ahead of me. Let me tell the story, all right? Friday night rolls around. Sun goes down, lights come on. Every, you remember this feeling. Everybody shows up. The whole town is out. The marching band, the cheerleaders, all of my friends up in the grandstands, my family, everybody is there. I start getting nervous. Don't mess this up, Ryan. Don't mess this up, Ryan. Don't mess this up, Ryan. Well, sure enough, Towards the end of the first quarter, I'm watching everything go down and Tyler looks over to me and he, he pats his helmet, he needs to come out. This is my time. My time to have my, this is gonna be my very first time on a football field in an actual game. I can't emphasize that uh, enough. And so I take a deep breath, everybody's watching me, and I take my first step out onto the football field. Here's the problem with my first step onto the football field. Backyard football 
You don't have to deal with this. And actual football, there are, are sticks that are 10 yards apart to, for the first down and a chain that, that runs. So that's why we said, like, move the chain. Okay, that chain is real. I didn't know that at the time. I learned it real quick because the first step I took, my foot grabs the chain and yanks the entire chain off of the sticks. The ref blows the whistle. It's like, we gotta, we, well, we have to stop now. And my coach is looking at me. My teammates are looking at me. My opponents are looking at me. Like, what are we doing? I look at Tyler, the first string guy, and I'm like, I'm just buying you time to rest. You know, like, like this is good. They get that all fixed up. And I jog out to my spot. Don't mess this up, Ryan. Don't mess this up, Ryan. Don't mess this up. And so I'm the wide receiver. I'm the guy on the very far end. All the big guys are in the middle. I try to stay away from that area. I'm thinking, it's my first play. Surely it's just gonna be like a run play and my job's gonna go to go block somebody and it's fine, right? I look over to our coach. Sorry for all the insider football language. We ran a no huddle offense, which means we'd look over to our coach, he'd give us a, a symbol or signal and that would be the play that we're running. So I look over and what I see is the coach go like this. Now, to everybody in this room, unless you were on my team, <laughs> that means nothing to you. To me, that means, oh no. <laughs> that means fly one. Now fly one is my play, but not my play where I go deep and catch, catch the touchdown pass and all that. Fly one is the play where I go in motion and I get a handoff from the quarterback in the trenches where all the guys who are like 100 pounds heavier than me are and it's my job to try to get around the outside. And when it works, it's a beautiful thing. When it doesn't work, it's not good. I'm like, this is my first play, you know? I felt like, have you ever been on vacation with, with somebody that doesn't know how to rest? And so they get to the hotel room and they immediately put their stuff down and they're like, let's go zip lining, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, God, let me unpack my bag. Like, can we like have a snack or something? <laughs> yeah. First play, fly one. Don't mess this up, Ryan. Don't mess this up, Ryan. Don't mess this up. Because I'm 16 at the time. Let's be real. Like, when I was 16, all I wanted was for girls to like me and for guys to think I was cool. So I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm standing there going, I'm a goofy looking kid with no personality. Like, this is all I have. Don't mess this up, right? <laughs> I go in motion, quarterback hikes the ball, hands it to me, just a me, I have the ball for a millisecond, and then just <laughs> fumble, which if you don't know, when you fumble, the other team can pick up the ball and then it's their ball, it's basically the worst thing that you can do. I go to jump on the ball, I forget that my helmet is covering half of my vision, and so I go to jump on the ball and there's a giant linebacker that just comes and blindsides me. I'm falling back like this. And I think if I have a career ending injury from this hit, like this is gonna go down in history as the worst football career ever. <laughs> Ryan got in for one play, messed up the chain, fumbled the football and he's out, you know? <laughs> Biggest insecurity, I, I get back up and I try to just camouflage in with my team. Because our coach, by the way, was this tall guy. He was a great guy, but he was very intense. He said a lot of words that I can't say up here, you know, and it was very loud and very intimidating. So my thought is I'm just gonna blend in with my team because I know he's coming to look for me and I don't want him to yell at me, right? And so I, I blend in with the team and sure enough, where's Ryan, right? Where's Ryan? He comes walking down and I'm like, I think he's over there. We should take him out. I don't think he's good at football. <laughs> Coach gets up to me, pulls me aside. Never forget what he said. Comes down to my level. He has to come pretty far. He's a tall guy. <laughs> Looks me in the eye, smiles, and he goes, now you're ready to play. Oh, Slaps me on the shoulder, turns around and starts yelling ridiculous things at the ref again, you know? <laughs> I'll never forget that moment as long as I live. I came face to face with my greatest insecurity and then I realized I still have breath in my lungs. Like I'm still in the game. 
In fact, I've experienced the thing that I was most scared of, and it wasn't that bad. And so I've, I've got this. My weakness has actually become my strength, and now I'm ready to play. And then a couple of years later, I started studying scripture and I realized that this pattern is all throughout the entire Bible. From Abraham to Moses to David to Peter to Paul and pretty much everybody in between, whenever a man or woman of God would, would come before God and be honest enough to go, I don't know what to do anymore. That's the moment that God's power starts to work in and through their lives because when you add God to the equation, your weakness actually becomes your strength. This is uh, Sean Johnson, our, our global pastor. This is his story. As he, for years, uh, led this, this thriving church um, and, and yet behind the scenes had so much anxiety along the way. And just in his mind, he was trying to be a good leader and so he, he didn't talk about it much, tried to put on a, a good front for people until it finally got, drove him to a point where he just had to come face to face with the weakness, where he had to start talking about it. And the reason we love him so much and I'm so honored to call him pastor is because um, at that moment, he just doubles down on his insecurity and he goes, hey, this is, this is me, this is where I'm at. This is the, the anxiety that I feel in my life. And he starts preaching about it left and right. He writes a book about it. And I'll tell you, there's not a week that goes by that somebody doesn't come find me and tell me, hey, attacking anxiety was exactly what I needed this week. I'm so thankful. Why? Because when you add God to the equation, your greatest weakness actually becomes your greatest strength. This is the Apostle Paul's story. We already talked about how he had a past. Now in the passage we just read, he has a thorn in his flesh. If you're like, he probably should have called a doctor. It's not an actual thorn, right? Scholars for thousands of years have debated what the thorn in Paul's flesh was, and we don't know. There's a lot of thoughts, like some people think it was a, a bad habit. Like in Romans 7, where he goes, I can't stop doing the thing that I don't want to do. Why do I keep doing the very thing that I don't want to do? Some scholars would say that it was a person or a group of people persecuting Paul. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. It's the most predictable pattern in the world. As soon as somebody starts trying to be a light in the world, they will start getting criticized. Because the rest of us, have our own pain and insecurities, and instead of facing them, it becomes easier for us just to throw stones at the people who are moving the ball forward. And so you start trying to be a part of the solution, you begin being blamed for all the problems. This was Paul's story. He even writes in 2 Timothy 4.14. This is a deep cut in scripture. He's writing to his buddy Timothy, and he goes, there's this guy, Alexander, that is just persecuting me. He's saying all sorts of mean things about me. I don't know what's going on. Just be, be careful around this guy. Maybe his thorn in his flesh was a person. Maybe it was pain. Like maybe even chronic pain. Paul was the take the hill guy. Maybe he had some, some physical pain that was, was keeping him on some days where he, he just wants to be, I wanna just keep building this church, but I gotta call it quits for, for the day. I'm in too much pain. We don't know what, what this thorn in his flesh was, which by the way, I'm thankful for because we all have our, our thorns in our flesh and it helps us relate. But we do know it was a weakness and an insecurity of Paul's. And so Paul just starts praying. And now, this is the apostle Paul. Like, goes around healing everybody, Paul. Casts out demons everywhere he goes. There's a, there's a verse in Acts 19 that says the handkerchief and the apron that Paul had was healing people. So like Paul would get done doing the dishes and they'd be like, hey, can we borrow that apron for a second? And they'd take it over to their friend and it would heal that. that like, that's the type of level of anointing and calling that Paul was operating in. But then when it comes to his own struggle, he comes to the altar and he goes, God, I've got this thorn in my flesh. Would you take it away from me? Nothing happens. So maybe a couple of months go by. Paul works up the strength again to, to face the pain again. God, would you please take this thorn away from me? 
nothing. The guy who heals people left and right, who sees God do so many miraculous things through him left and right, maybe a couple more years go by and he finally tries one more time. God, for a third time, I'm just asking, would you please take this thorn away from me? Nothing. Now at this point, if I'm Paul, I'm feeling a lot of emotions. One of the emotions I'm feeling is confusion. Right? Read the verse again three times. Verse 17, eight, or verse eight, three times. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. Paul gets to a point where he's tried three times and still nothing. I feel like if I'm in Paul's shoes, I'm feeling pretty confused right about now. You ever felt that way? Like you ever had a, a insecurity that um, keeps your life from moving forward and you do everything you can to try to get past it and still you haven't been able to? It can be a really confusing place. Now, I used to think that confusion was a bad thing. This week as I've been reading this, this passage, uh, I, I feel like what I needed to say today is that there's actually power in confusion. See, because when we think we have control of our lives, we approach it like this. As soon as we realize we're confused, we, we go like this. Control, confusion, control, confusion. Which of these two postures, life postures, do you think it's easier for God to, to speak through and work in and through? It's this one. Confusion is actually the thing that, that brings us to our knees where we go, I may not have it all together, but I'm gonna stop trying to figure it out and instead just surrender and worship the God who actually does have it all together. Confusion is actually a gift. And so I wonder today if for some of you, as we, as we start singing here in just a couple of minutes, if what a few of you need to do in this room is just admit to God as we sing, you're never gonna let me down, just go, God, it sure doesn't feel that way. And when we sing, you are good, for you just to be honest with God and go, I don't, I'm confused. If you're good, then, then, then how do you explain this? How do you explain that? Do you know that there's power in that? You know that God's not afraid of your confusion? It's actually a beautiful invitation for the, the two of you to have a, a moment. I wonder if today your worship is you raising your hands and declaring, God, you are good, even though I don't understand it yet. There is power in confusion. Let's keep going. Then Paul goes on to say, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. If I'm just being real, I, there are days I wish that verse wasn't in there. But the deeper I dive into it, the more I just learn to become so appreciative of this truth, that, that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Therefore, I love Paul. This is where he doubles down on his insecurity. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about that thorn in my flesh, about my weaknesses. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul understood that there is power in confession, there is power in just saying it how it is, shining a big light on the things that we like to keep hidden. Because when we start talking about our insecurities, it's like somebody just shines this giant light that allows God to work through, uh, in and through our lives. There's power in confession. Which by the way, if you are on the fence about whether or not you should sign up for a group, can I just say, having people in your life where a safe place for you to say, hey, here's how I'm really feeling, is one of the best things in the world. That's, what, that's one of the, the powerful things about having community as a Christian is people that you can confess things to. Let me, let me say it like this. Years ago, um, I was about to, this was 2010, I was about to preach my very first sermon. Uh, Doug and I were, were interns at our college ministry in Boulder, Colorado, and I got to, to preach one Tuesday night. And so I worked so hard on this sermon. I had like, it was probably like 10 different sermons, you know, that should have, should have just picked one. <laughs> Looking back. 
Galatians 5, 1 was my verse. It's for freedom that Christ has set you free. And I was so excited to get up there and preach about freedom. I had the whole thing planned out. And then the night before, I got super insecure about my message. Like really nervous, really anxious about it. And so I called um, Ethan's dad, uh, Justin, is a mentor of ours also just a friend of ours. He's the guy you want to call in that situation. I go, I go, Justin, I'm preaching tomorrow. I'm nervous. He goes, all right, get over here. So I drive over to his house and he goes, here's the deal. We're going to sit down and you're just going to walk me through your entire sermon. And then as soon as you get to the part that you feel insecure about, let's talk about it. So I go, okay. And I'm walking him through the illustration and the funny parts and the Bible verse and all these things. And I stop halfway through and I go, Justin, I can't preach this sermon tomorrow. He goes, why? He said, because I'm talking about freedom and I'm not free. I'm talking about freedom and my life is a mess. Which has always been true about us, but especially back then, like we were just trying to figure things out. He smiles and he goes, Of course you don't have the right to get up on that stage and talk about freedom. That's the whole point of the gospel is that you're just an imperfect person trying to help people understand a perfect God. He said this, he goes, stop trying to be Gandalf and start being Frodo, (laughs) which is another deep cut. (laughs) Lord of the Rings reference, if you didn't get it. Gandalf is the wise wizard who knows everything. Frodo is the the relatable hero who really doesn't know anything is just trying to figure it out as he goes. Jessica goes, don't stand on the stage and try to be the guy that has it all figured out. Follow me, do this. Just be the guy on the stage going, I don't know, I'm trying to figure it out. Here are some things that I've learned along the way. I go, Justin, I can do that. He goes, yeah, you you can do that. But here's the thing, none of that would have happened if I hadn't confessed how I was feeling to Justin. There's power in our confession because it shines a giant light on what's really going on and then you have a a playing field to to talk through things with trusted people. Hey, everybody doesn't need to know all your stuff, but somebody should. So be smart about it, you know, like trusted, trusted space, all of that. There's power in confession. And let's end the, the passage together. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight This is, I love Paul. He goes, I'm just gonna double down on my weaknesses, man. I delight in weaknesses, even in insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties. And then get this, for when I am weak, I'm strong. Paul understood Jesus really well. He understood that Jesus also went through all of these things. So Paul understood that, that his, his weaknesses are actually invitations and opportunities to connect with Jesus. And there's power in connecting with Jesus. Like here, like take, take your biggest insecurity. Think about it. Let's just hold it in front of you real quick. Is it betrayal? Because Jesus got betrayed by one of his best friends. He gets it. Is it abandonment? Loneliness, Jesus got abandoned by the 11 other best friends. Is it being made fun of? Jesus got put on trial and mocked for hours. Then went to a cross and hung there in the greatest act of, of think about this for a second. Religion is, is, is a deity up in the clouds looking down on us like Gandalf. The story of Jesus is God stepping out of heaven, going, I'm coming for you. I'm gonna experience it all with you, right alongside you. I'm gonna allow myself to become weak, even to the point of death on a cross, to show you where the real power comes from. Because the real power comes from three days later, where he defeats sin and death once and for all. Jesus didn't run away from weakness, he ran through it. Paul goes, hey, I will boast about my weaknesses because it's my opportunity to connect with Jesus. There's power in confusion, there's power in confession, there's also power in connection. 
Insecurities are actually a window, an invitation that we can walk through to experience that grit that we want to have in this world. And so I thought long and hard about how to end this message and I had like five different endings and yesterday I, I just realized I, I need to just tell, I just need to tell you a story um, about a friend of mine named Todd who was an atheist. This was years and years ago. He used to uh, come to church and he would sit in the message, but then worship would start and he'd go out into the lobby. And uh, I introduced myself to Todd, got to know him a little bit. And he, uh, he explained to me real quick, he goes, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm an atheist. And he goes, I hope that's okay. Which, by the way, for the record, that's not just okay. Like, that's, that's what we want. We want you to be, you're so welcome in this place. Thank you for being here. You are every bit a part of this place as anybody else. I tell Todd that. And uh, he's one of those logical guys who um, had a lot of questions. So, you know, he wasn't just an atheist. Half-heartedly, he thought about this stuff a lot. His biggest hang-up was, hey, if there really is a good God, why do so many bad things happen? It's the problem of evil. So like the biggest question, man, that, that we all wrestle with, right? So Todd and I would talk and I'd give him some of my responses and he would be like, yeah, okay, but still not for me. Well, I start to hang out with Todd a little bit more and I realize, or he tells me, um, that Todd grew up in a home where his, his dad was an alcoholic. And it's not my story to tell, so I'll just say it caused a lot of pain for the house and it caused a lot of pain for Todd. Um, it's one of those moments where you just realize that every behavior has a backstory. Like, my goodness, of course it's difficult for him to lift his hands and say, you are good to our Heavenly Father when that's been his upbringing, right? And... Uh, Time just continues and I just keep encouraging Todd to keep, keep coming back, man, keep coming back. We love having you here. His dad ends up getting saved and getting sober, um, but it's still really hard for, for Todd. He's got all this resentment, right? So he hangs out during the message, then he heads to the lobby, hangs out during the message, heads to the lobby. And then one day I see him singing. And he comes up to me after service and he has this huge smile on his face. He goes, Ryan, I get it now. I go, yeah, man, tell me, tell me what happened. He goes, my dad got a new job. He is now a counselor at a recovery center. He's using his past mistakes as power to now reach back and help a bunch of other people who are hurting and who are broken. I go, Todd's so cool, man. And Todd goes, alcohol. That was his thorn in his flesh. I go, oh, so now you think you can start quoting Bible verses at me? That's how this is gonna go? He goes, somehow God took his greatest weakness and turned it all around into his greatest strength. I said, yeah, Todd, God's God's pretty good at doing that. That's what he does best. Todd goes, I can worship that God. I say, yeah, 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 Todd, me too. That's the God that we worship in this place today. So would you guys stand to your feet with me? All across this room, there is questions and insecurities and pain and confusion. And I don't know where you are at today, but here's what I know. God is ready to meet with you. And if you will add him to the equation, your greatest weakness is actually about to become your greatest strength. You're ready to double down on your insecurity. God's ready to take that thing 
and change it, redeem your story, and then you're going to realize there are a whole bunch of other people in this world who have gone through similar things and they need somebody to say, hey, I understand. I know how it feels to be weak. I know how it feels to be confused. I know how it feels to feel helpless. Let me pull you up. Let me help you forward. This is the gospel. This is the God we serve. This is what God is best at. So as we sing, hey, if you're like, I, saying you are good, God, you're never gonna let me down. I don't, I don't know that I really believe it. I'm confused. Double down on that confusion. Sing through it. God can take it. I promise you God can take it. Double down on the confusion. Say, God, I don't know. I don't like where I'm at right now, but I know that you're in control. And so you can still be the king of my heart even though I don't feel it. Hey, if you're in here and you're riding high and you're on a, a, a victory right now, would you just worship with us in victory? And would you start interceding for your brothers and sisters who aren't? Would you start interceding that we would be a church with some grit and that that grit would come from us not being afraid of our weaknesses, but pressing into our weaknesses and finding the power on the other side? And if you're in this room and you feel far from God, like God is distant, like you don't even believe that he is there, let me say two things. You gotta get this. Number one is you are so, so, so welcome here. And that will never change. I'm so glad and honored that you sat in this sermon. Number two, God loves you more than you can imagine. I know it's hard to make sense of sometimes, and I know there are all of those questions. We can get to those questions later. Would you just try? Would you just try for, for a day, for a moment to worship this God? In fact, would you guys all put your, your, your hands out in front of you like, like this? We walk around like this, don't we? We walk around trying to control our lives. Let's all just open our hands for a second. It just feels, just feels good to surrender and say, God, I'm, I'm here. Whatever you wanna do through me and in my life as we worship, I'm here for it. So Father God, we love you so much. Jesus, we celebrate the fact that you came for us, that you became weak for us to show us what true strength actually looks like. So all across this room, as we turn our attention to you, we pray that you would be here with us and that you would remind us that when we add you to the equation, it's actually our weaknesses that make us strong in Jesus' name.